and of course no one really knows what happened to her. Two Greeks have different theories. One is that she is resurrected from the dead. One is that she is ascended into heaven. Another is that, well, she's dead. Which, you know, depending on your preferred choice, you know, there you go. Kind of interesting. Um, but by the way, very interesting in the same parallel way uh, that Jesus goes to the cross willingly, etc., as a sacrifice for others. That's kind of a Greek uh, thing. Um, except, of course, notice she's female. Kind of significant. Um, so the aesthetic, which is also hedonistic, the ethical. Agamemnon is the model that he mentions. And here it's interesting because Agamemnon doesn't believe it, doesn't really want to sacrifice his loved daughter. Uh, by the way, Clytemnestra will eventually kill him for it. Um, which is, by the way, why the movie Troy was terrible because in, in that movie, Agamemnon dies at Troy totally wrong because it screws up th at least three Greek, Greek tragedies that have to happen only if he survives and goes back home. His wife kills him. And then his daughter buries her brother for birth. Oh, I forget how it all goes. But they're all Sophocles. So, um, in fact, that movie that we were watching, I believe, was based on Sophocles, if you can name um, so the ethical is Agamemnon. It's unsatisfactory. Why? Perfect example, I think, are young parents today in our society who were perhaps raised in a religious environment, but as they got to college, they didn't believe it anymore. Uh, they went on, had a life, maybe got married, have children. And those children start growing up. And as they start growing up, the parents think to themselves, we should take these kids to church. So they do a search. They find a church that is uh, as amenable to their ideas as possible, and they take themselves and their child to this church, and they join it because they feel that the child needs to grow up in this kind of atmosphere. And by the way, sociologically, I would argue that they are right, uh, that you need a good foundation uh, uh, from which then you can branch off as you get older. Um, I've met a lot of people who deliberately avoided any church relationship uh, with their children and tried to raise them without it. This is not all the way, all, always the case, but in any, any case I knew a lot of them where the child as they got old enough didn't have that kind of basis and end up, ended up really despondent and having a great deal of difficulty. Um, but in any case, the, uh, the parents then join a church where they don't believe the ethical norm of that church. They don't believe the principles of this particular church, but they feel like it's going to be good for their child to have this basis. You, know, you need the tooth fairy. You need the Santa Claus. Are these lies to your children? But you know, they're, they're great for purposes, etc. And eventually, though, they're dissatisfied with this uh, association because they find themselves cheering on to certain moral principles that they don't really accept. So there's an unsatisfactory feeling that this isn't really my heart. I don't really believe this. I can't be behind it 100%. I'm just pretending. Remember, I, I, I asked a fellow professor once at a living room party for a particular church, and I whispered to him, I said, you don't really believe this stuff, do you? And he looked at me like, I can't talk about that here. Which told me, yeah, absolutely, he doesn't believe this stuff, but he knows how to participate, he knows how to do the uh, nominous Patris et filius et spiritus et spiritus sanctus amen, etc. Auremus, right? You know the whole thing. Gloria in excelsis Deo. As a kid, I never understood what eggshells had to do with Jesus. 
So, the ethical life is inherently unsatisfactory and you move on, you have to, you have to move on to a still new stage. And this he calls the religious. And as an example of this, it's Abraham, who, of course, in the biblical tradition, has been met by the Elohim, the plural, in the desert. They offered him all of this land to his prodigy, prodigy, pro the, his kid. So in any case, uh, the problem for him at that point, however, and his wife Sarai, Sarah, laughs at God, in the plural, that she's postmenopausal. There's no way she's going to have children. So in any case, um, she offers Hagar, her servant. Yes, we've talked about this one, right? Hagar, her servant, have a child by her, and of course, that actually works, and Hagar has a child, but the problem is it's totally screwing up the camp because now everybody's honoring Hagar, and Sarah is like, so Sarah says, take Hagar and her son Ishmael out to the desert, out away, and Abraham does, he takes Hagar out to the desert, and where God says, leave her here, he does, and so Hagar is stranded in the desert with just enough food for a few days, and so she runs from hill to hill to hill to hill around the circle where Ishmael is lying there kicking in the sand, and several different versions, of course, and in fact, this is not exactly the biblical version, but in the Arabic version, the angel Gabriel comes and bursts forth a well, and this is Mecca. Uh, and the tradition of Hagar running in the circle around is still uh, uh, what they do each year as the people all gather and, and move around in a big circle around the stone, you know, in the temple there. Uh, and so uh, Ishmael, God hears him. God in this uh, text would be El. So like Baal, the, the, the god Baal, the Babylonian god, Israel, temple of the most high God, um, etc. So, so El, Elohim is the plural. But so Ishmael, the oldest, by the way, obviously, but Sarai, does get pregnant and gives birth to Isaac. Are you remembering the story correctly? So Isaac. And at some point, God says to Abraham, take your only son up to the mountaintop and sacrifice him. Abraham gets the knife, the rope, takes his son, the bundle of wood to go up to the altar to sacrifice. And Isaac or Ishmael, which one is it? Do we know? No, we don't, actually. If it's the oldest, it would be Ishmael. If it's the oldest legitimate, it would be Isaac. But in any case, whoever this son is, is going to inherit the land. And guess what? The Arabs claim as their ancestor Ishmael, and the Jewish people claim Isaac. And so they still fight over whose land this is, by the way. It's just true, right? Gaza, right? We're aware of this. Is it from the sea to the river or from the river to the sea? In any case, sorry if I'm triggering anyone, but in any case, 
fly into the religious stage, the stage for Kierkegaard, because just the opposite of Agamemnon, who, in order to satisfy the ethical norm of his society, the expectation that he sacrifice his daughter that he loves, and does it despite the fact that he doesn't believe it. Abraham is going to sacrifice his only son, who he loves, and absolutely would not want to sacrifice. This was the meaning of his life, is this son, and yet he totally believes God wants him to do this. So here's the difference. Abraham believes it. It's faith, and that, that is the point of the religious, is your faith is totally one with what you believe and you're following as the purpose of life. And that's what we really need in order for us to be saved. You know you're saved when you suddenly realize this is the meaning of life. At least for me, that's what I need to do for my life. I know it. I just absolutely know it. And at that point, you no longer have this vicious dichotomy in your soul that tells you, I'm doing, I'm living my life as a fraud. That's not healthy for my mind, for anyone. I need to really believe that what I'm doing is right. And that is the stage of faith. Oh, and, and everyone knows he actually doesn't have to kill his son. Yes, you know how the story goes. Okay, so, so that's... He refers to this as the suspension of the ethical. The ethical is what society expects. His society absolutely did not expect him to go up and kill his only son. And I can guarantee you if Eagle River has, you know, you go up, you know, fall mountain or whatever, and take your son and start stabbing him to death, Eagle River will not accept this as a normal behavior. Um, so the suspension of the ethical allows Abraham to achieve an authentic commitment to God, even though, of course, God rescues him uh, by giving him a ram uh, to sacrifice instead. But to avoid ultimate despair, which is that, that despair that leads you to feel like your life is totally worthless. The individual must make a similar leap of faith into a religious life. And it's not necessarily, say, becoming a monk or a Roman Catholic or a Baha'i or yeah, a religious life in the sense that you're committed to a belief in the purpose of life. By the way, I'll go back to Hegel and point out that Hegel doesn't have this issue. He, in his phenomenology of mind or spirit or geist, explains how once you have this self-consciousness, then you go through these stages. These are natural stages that a, a self-consciousness will go through. And one of them is the happy consciousness, which is essentially where we are when we're in the aesthetic life. Another one then is going to be the unhappy consciousness. This is the one where you're living a false dichotomy. You're betraying your inner self by trying to live a certain way in order to satisfy other people. And then you get on to uh, a successful uh, understanding of life uh, that is a, a stage, really, where you become your own boss. You become your own decider of what you're supposed to be doing and you create life for yourself. And for Hegel, it's clearly a matter of understanding the progress of humanity through our increasing understanding of ourselves and our increasing ability to increase freedom and happiness for 
a greater number of people. This is very utilitarian. And by the way, I would argue uh, that pragmatists are essentially right smack in the middle here. As pragmatists, we grew up in a society where we learn that there are certain absolute moral principles. Are there? Maybe not. Uh, we're also certain that we grew up with an absolute commitment to being the best we can be. Uh, but we have to also be concerned about our community. As a result, we have these, these different cultural views of what we ought to do, and we're in the middle trying to make these pragmatic decisions for ourselves and for others. It's very complex, it's very confusing, but it's the right way to go. Kierkegaard emphasizes the self, doesn't believe that we're really attached to this ethical community in any way that forces us to do anything. We're free, we're condemned to be free, as John Paul Sartre would say, right? You can't, can't deny that you are making free choices, even if you're a Nazi and you're doing what you're being ordered to do, you could deny those orders. Well, but they'll kill me. Well, that's your choice, right? Um, so Kierkegaard is totally focused on the self. And by the way, as, as kind of a template for what becomes existentialism, the Europeans are still kind of faced with this, although to some extent it's also now referred to as postmodern postmodernism, uh, individuals have to decide for themselves. There's no sense of, of 